or practical. Or... Anyway, I've got to stop. I'm, I'm in the presence, and the presence is really playful right now, or I am feeling playful in the presence. I, God is a playful God, and so, uh, but, but then I could easily step past people's uh, what would feel like uh, acceptable behavior, so I don't want to lose the moment we're in. We're in a mo- we are in a moment. <laughs> Tuesdays in the, uh, Jan- January 31st, and we'll go through all the way February, March, we'll do a two to, four a two to four in the afternoon prayer meeting every day so we can position our hearts in prayer, too, toward these discoveries. So uh, I'm really excited, and I think that uh, what's coming this weekend will help, to help uh, give us a, a compass bearing, a direction. So, uh, Kim, let's go to, I'm going to do two uh, big thoughts, and then I want to share a really familiar story with all of us. And so I want to go to Revel. I want to go to Philippians three. I believe I'm in verse fourteen. I'll check and verify. And I want to. I want to introduce a thought. You've already heard it before, but I like you. I I love the Bible. Don't you love the Bible? I mean, the Bible gives me so much freedom because it's truth, and because it's if it's in the Bible, then it's okay to do. So, I, so therefore, I'm always looking to the Bible to give me per, to either validate what God's Spirit's initiating, or to open a door where I'm stuck and can't get free. So, in verse 17, 17, I'm sorry. This is the part of this chapter we don't normally read. Let me read it, brethren. Join in following my example, and note those who walk, so as you may have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven. I want to introduce the thought, the truth, that you have a dual citizenship. All right? You have a citizenship of one country or maybe multiple countries on this planet. But you also, if you have received Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart, have confessed him as Lord, he's come in by the Spirit, you've been born of water, born of the blood, born of the word, you have a citizenship now in heaven. It's not just one that guarantees you entrance when you get there, it is accessible every day, and it's where we are seated with Christ. So for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So here we is the paradox. You have been, and I have been called into a new citizen tree and where we get to be, enjoy, become, delight, and find our residence. And yet we have to walk out the in our earthly walk. So we have the days of our flesh, just as Jesus had the days of his flesh, and sometimes those are as trying as his days were. And yet we have a place of residence and reference that we're learning to live in, and there's the promise that Jesus is coming in a fashion that he will subdue everything that's on uh, that concerns us to his glorious resurrection. So even though we may feel like sometimes you're between you know, like between two horses pulling two different directions, and you feel you're going to rip in half, God says, I'm going to pull all of that which is mine, which is you, into me, and all that's pulling and fighting and struggling, it's going to let go. It's going to let go. And therefore, don't, come, don't fall back into just the, the worldly, earthly thought patterns. Because that's not where you are coming from. You're coming from heaven now. Heaven is your home. Heaven is your point of origin. So with that said, let me show you a scripture in Revelation 7. This is teaching time. Uh, big thoughts. I mean, I'm really big thoughts. I didn't even have permission to think these thoughts 15 years ago. Uh, verse 9. I'm going to... You know, I'm going to read a lot of Bible, just, just, to, just to, it's so good, the Bible. Say, I love the Bible. No, say it. I love the Bible. I love the Bible. It's, it's the word of truth. 
After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations and tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with robes and palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, the four living creatures, they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So that's an incredible moment. Then one of the elders answered and saying to me, said, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where'd they come from? And as you learn, you say, Sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Verse 14 again, dual citizenry. This is a proof, a picture of dual citizenship. We have an experience of worship going on by a company of people who are now beginning to serve God at his throne before his in heaven. Yet, the people described are not people that have died and gone to heaven because the very nature of the interaction of God with them reflects the nature of what we need from God in our life on the planet. In other words, you don't have sunstroke in heaven. You don't have a heat problem. You don't have a hunger problem. You don't have a thirst problem. You don't have a crying issue, trauma issue. By that time, that stuff's gloriously resolved. So we have a people that are now joining in the, the truth and Blessing and praise that salvation belongs to God, comes from God, originates to, from Him, from God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Their, 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 their voice is becoming, beginning to be a part of the chorus that uh, actively initiates a new sound from the elders and the living creatures. And they're white-robed, and they've got te- you know, the, the, the palm branches, and they're waving, and they're praising. And so the question is, who are they? And so the, the, it's a, I want you to see this because this will help whatever we're going through. He says, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. Now, everybody typically reads that, go, oh, yeah, I don't want to be in the great tribulation. <laughs> Seven years or maybe it's three and a half or maybe it's forever. <laughs> and I, you know, we, we, first off, the word the isn't in the Greek there. And uh, so it really would be, came out, would be one Greek word, great would be one Greek word, and tribulation would be one Greek word. So you could say they came out of mega tribulation. That's what Greg is, great is. Now, I don't know about you, but first I'll be honest with you. Every time I go through something, that's a great tribulation. I don't know about you. I don't think there is the great. You see, the the messes us up because it puts us on a time pattern, a chronological order. The whole book of Revelation is experienced now and is coming, now and is coming. And you can step inside. So here's the deal. When we go through our great tribulation, we learn something we didn't understand, but we learn it because it's our only means of making ourself can stay in union and connection. And it is such a powerful truth is that we learn that we are here, received, loved, accepted by the blood of Jesus. And he is the substantiator of my right to be here, my inheritance, my calling, my sonship. And we and and in effect, this storm pulls up the things to which we need to bring to the blood of Jesus as sufficient for these things. And they lose their place. And all of a sudden, a robe of life is made white by the blood of the lamb. In that process, we are becoming a people then that are dwelling in the presence of God. We are beholding the face of God in the throne room. And he is now uh, 
calling us into more and more joyful service where we love and delight in ministering to him. And he now is dwelling and surrounding us in a real time. And we're starting to see it even change the circumstances of life that we're on so that the sun stops, starts cooperating. The heat doesn't penetrate. The hunger issues start to get resolved. The thirst issues get to resolve. And the reason is, is because Jesus is our shepherd. He's actively shepherding us, feeding us, leading us, feeding us, leading us. And I want to talk about how he feeds and leads today. Because when he starts to feed and lead, what he's doing constantly is taking us to the fountain of living water, to an encounter of life. And in the encounter of life, there will be an, a release of the tears. And, and it's just, it's just, it's happening. But, oh, wow. Turn with me to John 4, please. So let's, I want to get, Cam and I were talking. I know when I get sometimes out there and I see all of this and I exp start experiencing all of this, you might think, gosh, either you, you're not, or I wish I could, and or I already am, or you're telling me more work to do. So when I go around, oh, our hearts are going to be a mansion for God. It's just, you, oh, it's just, you're going either, yeah, so tell me something I don't know. I'm already doing that. Or I hear that as more work to do. And it's not, for, it's not releasing. It's not freeing. It's just something more to focus on. So when I look at Revelation 7, and I real know that to be, this is, I believe, an imagery picture of the sanctification of the saints by belief in, this, in truth and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the active applying of the, the finished work of Jesus Christ, which is witnessed in the blood. This is what's happening to you. As my little grandson would say, this is your car wash. You're getting washed and cleansed and made beautiful. And this is how it's happening. And the security and the active involvement of God in, in the process, calling us, beckoning us, making us more in union and delight and joyful. And yet, life is going on and life is happening. And to some of us, that doesn't seem like an answer to anything. So the Lord draw, drew me to this story over and over and I believe it might have to do with just the fact that, well, let's just start reading it. Uh, John 4, 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Humanity lives in a frightened, controlling competitive, fearful place. And we're well aware in this level. And we're well aware of who's doing better and who's doing worse. And we like it when those who we're competing with are doing worse, because that must mean we're doing better. And he's, there's, a, uh, there's an upheaval that's taking place just because the John the Baptist ministry is closing and the Jesus, the Messiah ministry is launching. And that's not the point of comparison. So Jesus removes himself out of comparison. And he says, I'm going up to Galilee. So it says, but he needed to go through Samaria. Samaria is the West Bank of today. In the day of Jesus, it was known as Judea and Samaria because of the two tribes of Judah and then the 10 northern tribes, which began to be that region known as Samaria. So he had to go through the West Bank. Literally, it is there today. And he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sikar, which t is today Nablus, and had been always known from Abraham's day to, as the city of Shechem. Uh, it is the place where Abraham first entered into, into the promised land through coming down from the north, where at, um, oh, I took some time to learn some words, so I'm going to pull them out because it's, it's just fascinating. He came uh, to uh, the place where the, they call it the in the Bible in Genesis 12, the Terebinth Tree of Moray, 
where he was given the promise, if you look eastward, northward, southward, all of this, I'm giving you the land, I'm going to set you in a position of life, I'm giving you inheritance. And so he introduced, comes into an experience which is on a mountain east of the city of Shechem. Years later, uh, Jacob is back in Shechem and buys a portion of land. Years later, Joseph's body is brought up out of Egypt and put back in his burial place. And even years later, Joshua brings the company of Israel into the area of Shechem where there are two mountains. One is the mountain of Gerizim and another mountain called Ebal. Gerizim is called the mountain of blessing and, Geriz, and uh, Ebal is the mountain of cursing. And that is on the west side of Shechem. So Shechem is in a valley. It is Nablus. You can look it up and read all about it. it you cannot go there today. You're, if you're an Israeli, you're not allowed at all on the West Bank. If you're a tourist, you're not going to find very few people to take you there because it's just very hostile. It's very agitated. And it was that day. And it was back then. On the Mount of, of Gerizim and then Ebal, six tribes got on one, on, on one mountain, the other got on the other mountain, and on the mountain of Ebal, they placed uh, white washed stones and wrote the curses of the law and they declared these are the curses if you don't keep the law and you can still see from the other side of Shechem on the uh, eastern side uh, others on the eastern mountain of which is now called today in Israel it's called uh, Alon More Alon More we were there a couple three years ago you can uh, see where the, there was these stones put up on that mountain of Ebal. And so, which is kind of an interesting thing, because in the middle of Shechem, on one side is the law, on the other side of Alon Moreh, where Abraham received the promise. The promise is how we are to advance. The law brings us into cursing. That's why the, the, the whole issue was the law writing was left on the mountain of cursing, not on the mountain of blessing, because it was not going to bring the blessing of Abraham, which comes by faith. Okay, so, so it's funny, because we're, we're all concerned about what's happening in France and Paris, as 70 nations come together to discuss how to bring peace to the Middle East, and Israel fears that it's just set up to impose upon them uh, situations which they have no right, no way out. And other and, and some people think we're about Zechariah 14. I'm hopeful that we're about Zechariah 12. But it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's interesting. Jesus has to walk through that city. I believe Jesus is coming to the West Bank. I believe he's going to walk and begin to appear and enter into situations that are just like the one we're about to look at. And this one is so life-giving to me. So life-giving. So let's, uh, let me just read the story, and then we'll, we'll go on. So uh, he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sikar, or Shechem, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his sons, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which is 12 o'clock noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into that city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. See, same thing. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you a living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, that drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, 
Call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, <clears throat> I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the one whom you do not, you ha now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Well, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came. And they marveled that he talked with a woman. That no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went to her way into the city and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Oh, Father, thank you for this story recorded for us that illuminates so much of the way Jesus continues to move this day when he meets us on earth. And yet, thank you that you are still in your ministry in heaven leading us to fountains of living water. And I pray that in our time together, you will lead each of us to drink living water. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. I changed the title of what I put the the book, uh, what I put this uh, message on the secret place. I called it "How to Abide in Christ and His, and His Words Abide in You," which is a great practice. That's John 15. To really, what I call it now is how to have a conversation with Jesus, because in the week the Lord kept drawing me to the circumstances of life to illustrate how He uh, finds us. So. Let me, retell, let me tell you the story and let us just imagine with, with Jesus. He's sitting at the well. It's 12 o'clock. He's tired. He's been walking for a bit. It's the, it's the main highway from Jerusalem up to Galilee. He's sitting, sends his disciples to go get food. A woman comes up. And as she approaches, she's about noon and she's coming for her water. And he can tell that she's uh, hurting, that she's tired that she's uh, just, you know, fragmented, she's fragile, she's rough, she's ready for a fight, kind of like how Cammy was explaining how she felt, you know, you could just, you could feel the guardedness of this woman, which is a very obvious in our conversation that they have. And Jesus, because he's always looking to touch the real me, not the, not the one I'm projecting, or think he wants to see, but the real me, he did for her what he does for me often. He just asks for something that I'm currently involved in. Can I have a drink? This immediately stirs a couple issues up with her. There's cultural taboos, as it is very much in, in much of the Orthodox or uh, Islamic countries of today. Men do not talk to women, and women do not talk to men. But there's also the personal issue that we'll, we find out later that, you know, men are really not very faithful. You go through them quicker than you wish. And this is also a Jew, and we're a Samaritan, and we've been rejected by the Jews for so long. It's like there's they're literally on Mount Gerizim, today are the ruins of and still an active community of a temple that was built during the days of Nebu uh, Nehemiah because they were because the corrupt priesthood was thrown out so they went and just made their own replica of the worship so there's just a lot of issues that are that are that are deep but aren't you know that they show up you know it's a lot of times god sets our life conversation with him in the circumstance that we're walking through to act to help us l get to a place where we see the real issue he'd like to touch, heal, and deliver. 
and we don't understand it, and he's masterful at it. He's masterful. So he says, well, if, if you knew the gift of God, and if you knew who was talking to you, you would ask of him, and he would give you living waters. And you can tell the skepticism in her voice. How are you going to do that? Well's deep. You don't even have anything to get it from. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and, and, and his children and livestock? See, it's so funny because there is a place of, of union and delight in the presence of God that when you're there, just enjoy it. And, and allow that to become more and more your familiar home. But that isn't alone how God really changes us. Because he's more interested right now in my life in the where I'm living on planet Earth and how that's impacted me and how it's affecting me and how I'm currently living it out. And I might be hiding through behind religion. I might be hiding behind rebellion. I might be off on a tangent that just is giving me a, uh, something to occupy my, my life with. There's a lot of things happening. And he's the one going, I want to release my son, Steve, that I purchased and whom I have inheritance and who cannot but become what I've made him to be. And I just want to get a connection point. So, but we have all these kind of like, well, I don't know about that. How can you do this? What about that? So Jesus says to the woman, well, if you drink from this well, you'll be thirsty again. But if, if you drink from the water that I'll give you, that water will become in you a well that will begin to spring up, bubbling artesian well that will flow upward into eternal life. And this little lady, now she's got it. Now, we, now he's got her attention. He touched something, a life a whisper, a hope, something has caught her. And she says, give me this, give me, give me this water that, that I don't have to come, to, that I'll never thirst and I don't have to come to this well. Every time Jesus is introducing truths to us, we are misinterpreting what he's fully meaning. That's okay, just keep going. Do you understand? Don't stop in an experience with God because it isn't so that you never have to go back and get water. She's going to have to go get water the next day. It's just that it's, it's a greater water. It's, super, it's life. It's, in fact, what is this water? We'll have to figure that out. So he looks at her and he says, go. Bring your husband. Go get your husband and bring him here. Oh, what did he touch? The, probably the biggest level of shame issue. Rejection, fear. You know, in my mind, I even think that woman went at noon to get water because she could just miss the crowds. Didn't have to deal with, there she is again. Can't seem to, you know, I mean, God, you ought to go to her freedom encounter, see if we could break this stuff up. <laughs> you know, look at her, you know, she goes to husbands like cars. So she guarded. Last thing in the world she expected that day to have a conversation with Jesus and he would deal with the issue of her husband. I can, I can feel it. And, and, and let the Lord today, what would be the most awful thing for Jesus to ask you to show and prove? See, we think God wants us to kind of like, okay, I'm here now. What did you do for me? And just don't ask me to show you this. Because this thing really didn't go well. This part of my life really sucks. This part of trauma, just confusion, it just, I, no, don't. And so, but Jesus asked her, I want to see your husband. Sir, I have no husband. Now we think of it, if we think of Jesus as a, I'm going to catch you and make you pay, that he's like, aha, I got you. But it, he's more like, ah, ah. I'm going to have a moment of truth. He said, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with isn't your husband. That you've spoken truthfully. 
That's a powerful word. Truth there, and in all cases, means not covered, not concealed. You've opened your heart. You just had, we just, we just now began an initiative. We just now beginning a conversation. We started a conversation in, in, in back and forth, but now I'm, I'm here to where I want to, this is what I've come for. This is, what, this is where you need living water, right here in the shame place, right here in the, in the failure, right here in the betrayal, right here in, in what you're carrying. I wanna, I, I, you ask for living water, I'm bringing you living water. I don't need your husband to be here. Now listen, I know for many ladies in this room, you would love Jesus to say, go get your husband and bring him here to me. <laughs> I got some things I want to tell this man. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Go for it. But there's, <laughs> but there's other places in life we wouldn't want him to ask us to go and bring because they're for us, they're the woman's issue here. The, the, the just abys- dismal failure. So she then goes, Look, I, you are, whoo, I perceive you're a prophet. And now goes back. We're, going, we're still in cultural issues. We're still in who's, who gets to have Temple Mount and who wants Jerusalem and blah, blah, blah. Because people live from where they have been, have, have formulated their, their belief systems. And our belief systems, as wonderful they are, sometimes become the hindrance to the new thing God's trying to introduce of himself. So he says, well, you know, you, our fathers tell us right up on that mountain up there, right up in Gerizim, there's a temple. That's where we worship. But you Jews, you tell us, we can't worship there. We have to worship in Jerusalem. That's literally the language of the Greek there. You, we have to. And Jesus said, you guys don't know what you're worshiping. <laughs> we know what we're worshiping because salvation is of the Jews, which we must all affirm no matter who we are, that the only people that have ever been given truth to carry in covenant to reveal the Messiah who would be the savior of the entire world, are the Jews, Israel. So all other religions are counterfeiting. And even today's present Christianity, which all of, a lot of its paganism mixtures are things that we tend to, we would get into argument with the Jew over. But if everything, everything in the Bible is to lead you to Jesus, everything about God is to lead you to Jesus, every encounter, and that is which, so Jesus says, you know what? We won't go there. We know what we worship. But, but the hour is coming now is when you won't even, you won't worship in Jerusalem. You won't worship here because God is a, is a spirit and he's seeking those who worship him in spirit and truth. Catch his truth. Something really important in this moment of exchange where water is about to flow and, and life is starting to be given is that God desires truth in the inward man. When my life of rising up into the heavenly to, uh, to behold his goodness and his glory and meditate in his truth and enjoy his presence becomes a performance and it becomes things I must observe, becomes things that I must make sure I don't disqualify myself for, blah, 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 then I am now not living in the honest I never can get up to heaven without your help. I'll never be accepted in your presence without your blood. You're not impressed how holy I am, nor are you depressed how holy I'm not. You just want me to be fully believing truth about Jesus and fully truthful about me. And so I have to pause and I have to go, God, I love being in heaven, but right now I'm having a really bad day. And I'm like, Cammie, I really don't care about heaven right now. I want you to fix my problem. (laughs) And somehow sharing that often releases that issue so I can go back and enjoy God. And I didn't even get the thing fixed. Or sometimes I start getting to an issue and I get to the problem that's physical. And then he starts saying, well, let's talk about this water issue you're having. And then somewhere, somehow, he, one moment, he says, okay, I'm ready to do it. Just go get me this one thing. Oh, not that. Not that part. Because that's the place that I haven't had success. I have failure here. I have no, no access. I can't bring you that. You want me to get it? I don't have it. But there we are. There we are a moment. 
Have a drink, Steve. <sighs> You're right. So Jesus talks about this worship of spirit and truth. There is just as much that we can say that as I enter into worship, I should, agree, I should come by the spirit and I should agree with truth. As just much as it is to say when I come to worship, there's times I must come in my spirit and tell the truth of my heart. And both are living and giving and receiving. Well, so the woman then says, I know the Messiah is coming. I know, I know there's, something, there's a completion. Everyone in us in this room online, you know this from the past. You know it intuitively. You know there is someone that God is sent or sending who will liberate us from the plight we're in, and he will bring us forward. And she's, she's vulnerable. She's been fully exposed. He hasn't, notice, he has not said, oh, lady, we need to talk about this sin issue about adultery. He's not even going to mention it. She doesn't need to mention it. He just did. It's already been mentioned. And it's already been paid for in his blood. When do we get free? Is when we see Jesus for who he is. And what he's done for us frees us from what we've done to ourselves. And it can be a sound, it can be a sight, it can be a song, it can be a moment. We, we discover that we're still on the ground. Everybody said we had to be stoned. Nobody stoned us. That's not, not what I'm saying. <laughs> and we look up and he goes, where's your accusers? Did anybody not condemn me? He says, no, Lord, nobody's accused me. He goes, neither do I. And that's when you fall in love with Jesus. When you get into a group of people that you're all so pious and so, you know. <laughs> and you go, I could never be like that. But somehow this Jesus is there and you want to touch him and you press through all that. <laughs> and you get in there, this, the lonely place that left is at his feet. And you break down. The last thing you want to do in the middle of <laughs> puffy people, you know, you don't want to. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're already feeling from that those feet acceptance and love and reception, and you don't even understand. You just. just crying, then you're wiping with your teeth, you know, with your hair, well, not with my hair, but your sleeve or something, you know. <laughs> you're, you're, in, you're experiencing something so powerful, and you're not even aware now. All of a sudden, you you don't even know where you are, and all this, <laughs> now, and the guy who owns the house is, oh, gosh, if this man was a prophet, if he really was a prophet. He didn't know what kind of woman's touching. And she's sinful. That's what religion is. Sawdust. It's lifeless. It's captivating. It's bondage. It puts people under uh, systems they can never, uh, never arrive at. It's always never enough and always got to do more. It's, a to it's tormenting. It's ostracizing. It's separating. It's awful. And... Jesus, who loves to stand in, the, in, the, in, in front of religion to protect his sons and daughters, says to Simon, hey, Simon, i got to ask you a question. There were two people. One owed his, and they both owed this one man the same money. One owed about three months of wages, and the other owed more like three years, ten times the amount. Neither of them could pay, and so the, the man who, to whom they owed the money just flatly, he decided he'd just forgive both of them, the debt. One, say, $20,000, the other, you know, uh, $200,000, $2 million. Who's going to love him more? I said, well, I guess the one who's got the biggest debt released. And he says, you're right. You know, when I came over to be with you, You didn't hug me. You didn't greet me. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't anoint me with oil. And this woman, since the moment she's gotten here, she's not ceased to wipe me, you know, my feet with her tears and her hair, and she's just engaged in love because she's been forgiven. 
Now, there's not a word exchanged. She just didn't go around and go, Shh, I forgive you. Didn't need to. They made contact. Living water was being exchanged. Life was flowing. Something was happening, and she was coming alive. When the woman who's at the well, who's now having an engagement, I know there's someone coming. I know there's an answer. I know there's life. I know there's a Messiah. And he goes, I'm him. Oh, he's him. And again, just in God is beautiful time, here come his disciples. <laughs> Got your lunch, dude. <laughs> and they're going, Peter. Yeah. John says, is that a woman he's talking to? Yeah, 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 yeah. Think we should bust her head? No, no, no. They just kind of just, just, you know, how we all walk around, you know. No, I, I won't let that bother me. You know, just never processing. Conversations with Jesus about real life, where I'm living, how I'm doing, what is he doing? Think of this. How do we engage? He's making a promise. You're talking about living water. How do I get the living water? You don't have anything to draw from. Are you, are you saying you're superior to the Baptist doctrine? Are you telling me I can have living water? Yeah, but, 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 you, but are you saying we don't? Oh, you just, and he just keeps getting you and you get pulling you and pulling you and pulling you and pulling you. And finally says, hey, if you want it, come give me this. Not that. Not bad. <laughs> and the shame and the blame and the hurt, the trauma, the drama, the tears, they well up and all of a sudden you're having an encounter with God. And he's revealing, I am your Messiah here. I am your Savior here. I am your freedom. I am your deliverance. I will protect you. You will not be hurt. You will not be stoned. You will not be destroyed. You will not be taken away and shamed and blamed. You are, I am, we are one. Disciples don't understand it, but what does she do? She leaves her water pot, runs into the city, and shouts, Come see the man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? That is the sound of the testimony of experiencing Jesus Christ every time. The thing I hide today in shame over my inability to conquer control or accomplish becomes the billboard I blast across the earth to say truly the one I just met has to be the Christ because this is the issue that he just dealt with. Do you understand that? That is the Jesus who's encount encountering us to leading us to fountains of living water to have experiences of tear removal, trauma um, doing, because this is spirit and truth. This is the reason he came. And so a conversation with Jesus today is having it around the circumstances, inside the circumstances, regarding the heart issues, without, until there comes those moments where that you just realize, gotcha. I'm glad you got me. Earlier, I was really working hard not to let you get me, but now I'm glad you got me. Do you understand how that is? Because we, we've made real genuine kind. This is not religion. This is you. Ah, ah, to have all of me. Oh, I believe the Lord's, that's what we're in the midst of. That's the invitation. That's the movement on the planet. That's why all the things that are happening in the earth are, are, are going exponentially big. It's because God's going intentionally deep. The Bible says that the counsel of a man's heart are like deep waters, but a man of understanding knows how to pull them out. I believe Jesus knows how to pull out our deep stuff. Not to shame us, and not to set us out, ostracize us. That's already happened. We're already living under those prisons. But to liberate us, to call us into acceptance and freedom and release that we could never have thought we could ever gain or re-earn. So if you'll just close your eyes with me, we'll just close for in this moment of prayer Holy Spirit I, I know that I know I can't identify on my own what it is that I'm really what's the deep real issue that we're, I'm struggling with 
I may be frustrated about water or reputation or past ills or sins of people have committed or doctrines that people are holding. I could be on a lot of issues. And I would ask you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus, come and have a conversation and draw, out, draw me out. Draw me out. I know sometimes, for me, a lot of times, the drawing out begins in a crisis. Begins in me being all upset, all angry, all afraid. And after I work through the control stuff, then you can begin to talk about why are you responding like this? And you're not ever, 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 ever making me feel like I shouldn't have responded like that. It's just like you're lifting off the reasons and the dismantling the lies and, be, and pouring living water into my being. Lord, we don't really want to, you know, create another temple when you said we'd become your temple. We don't want to create another doctrine when you are truth. And we certainly don't want to create a new technique when you are the way. So today and forever, we ask that you, the way, the truth, and the life would come to us. Find us. And we have life to live, and we're going to be living in life. Find us, please. Engage us in conversation. Help us to just go with it a little bit here, a little bit there. And when you begin to probe, you know we're going to put up our, our defenses, our questions, our comparisons, our religious beliefs. But even so, Lord, don't stop. Talk. Ask questions. And Lord, as scary as it is, it's never been different for me every time you do it. When you finally help me see me, <laughs> I see you. For some reason, when you help me see me, I see you. Not the tyrant, tyrant, tyrant demanding religious observance, but a loving Savior, kind, gentle, liberating, freeing, powerful father who loves Lord help each of us now engage in the conversation that you initiate or we continue in until we can see you when we see me that we can have those moments and then explanation and then liberation because whatever tyranny of life that is ruling over us loses its grip when we see the living Savior and we leave it all and broadcast you. <laughs> we can't do it without you. So we give you permission. We desire more than anything that you'd come and have a conversation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessings. <sighs> Thank you guys so much. We're going to have the ministry team available for prayer. Uh, we'll hear more about the Freedom Encounter on this coming Wednesday. Have a wonderful day. Have a great conversation with Jesus.